What's up my pre-calc people? I'm Michael Princhak. In this video, we're going to talk about topic 2.8, inverse functions out of AP Pre-Calculus. Now, inverse functions are pretty easy, and hopefully you already know a lot about them, but in this video, I just want to do a quick review over how to find inverse functions with you're working with a table, a graph, or with an analytical representation of a function. So let's dive right into it. So before we dive too far in talking about inverse functions, let's quickly remind you what a function is. So a function takes inputs and gives you outputs, with only one simple rule, is that every input is allowed to have one and only one output. Now an input could take you nowhere, I mean an input could possibly lead to does not exist or undefined, that we certainly see that in rational functions all the time with holes of vertical asymptotes, but you cannot have more than one output for any one given input. Now an inverse function simply goes the other way around. It takes the outputs and gives us inputs. Now we denote an inverse function with this f raised to the negative one. Now that does not mean an exponent. That negative one is not an exponent, right? It's not like it's two to the negative one or three to the negative one or even x to the negative one. We're just using that f with the little subscript of negative one to emphasize that we're going backwards, working with an inverse function that takes outputs and creates inputs. Now, an inverse function is also a function, so it also has to have that same rule where we cannot have multiple inputs going to multiple different outputs. So let's talk about how to find inverse functions first when you're looking at a table. Now, this is actually the easiest thing to do. When you have an input output table, first, let's confirm that this is a function. Negative three goes to five and nowhere else. Two goes to seven, nowhere else. Okay, you get the point. Now, how do I create the inverse function for this table? Well, it's really easy. All you have to do is switch all the inputs and outputs. It's that easy. So we're going to take the outputs, switch them with the inputs, and then the inputs become our outputs. So here is that table. I mean, look how easy that is. Now, don't forget the big thing I did was that I identified this as the inverse function. So all of the inputs, negative three, two, five, seven, or excuse me, six and nine, are now my outputs, but that's only true if I'm using the inverse function. So do not forget to label this with that little f raised to negative one, indicating we have an inverse function. But that's how easy it is to find an inverse function from a table. Now, what about finding inverse functions from a graph? Well, this is also really, really easy. For all points, X and Y, all you have to do is switch your X and your Y. So the new points are the inverse function, R, Y, comma, X. So if I have a point, you know, two, comma, three of my original function, I see that in my graph. In the inverse function graph, it's going to be three, comma, two. All I got to do is switch the X and Y. It's that easy. Um, you could think of this as a reflection across the line y equals x, because if you just switch all of your x's and y's, you're basically reflecting yourself across the line y equals x, and that's exactly what an inverse function is. It's that reflection across the line y equals x. And what's happening when you reflect across the line y equals x? You just switch all of your x's and y's. So if you have a graph, all you got to do is take any point on that graph, switch the x and y, and you have the new point that would be on the inverse function or the graph of that inverse function. Really, really, really simple. All right, now what about finding inverse functions from an analytical representation of a function? This is where we have to get our hands dirty and do a little bit of work. But guess what? It's pretty simple. So there's four basic really quick steps here. First, when you have your analytical representation of the function, the first step you're going to do is change the f of x to a y. Just replace that f of x with a y, because isn't that what f of x is anyway? Then you're going to switch all of your x's and your y's. So any x becomes a y, any y becomes an x. Then you're going to solve for y. That's where you're going to have to do some work, right? That's where mistakes can be made because we've got to do some algebra work to solve for y. Then we're simply going to identify that final answer as the inverse function. So we want to change the y that we just solved for to f raised to the negative 1 of x, which is, again, not an exponent. It's just f Negative one is just the inverse function. That's just our notation to recognize and to, you know, to verify that, hey, this is now an inverse function. So let's actually see these four steps play out in a couple of examples. So here's our first example of an analytical representation of a function, 4x minus 5. Step one is changing the f of x to a y. That's a pretty easy step. Step two is switching all of our x's and y's so that y becomes an x, and this x becomes a y, and then we're going to solve for y. So the first thing we're going to do is add 5 that we're going to do x plus 5 equals 4y. That'll 
cancel out that minus 5. Then we're going to divide everything by 4 to get these 4s to reduce away, and that becomes 4 divided by 4 is just a 1y, and we get x plus 5 divided by 4. All right, that's step 3. I solved for y. Now for the final step is to identify this isn't y anymore. This is the inverse function, and that is x plus 5 divided by 4. Or if you really wanted to, you could do 1 fourth x plus 5 fourths. Don't necessarily have to, but just a different representation of that function. Pretty easy to do, not overly complicated. All right, let's do another one here with the analytical representation of this function, the square root of 3x minus 2. So we're going to first change that f of x to a y. Again, another really easy step. Switch all of my y's and x's. Not too hard there as well. And now I get a solve. So how do I get rid of a square root? I'm going to square both sides. So I get x squared on the left. On the right, I just get 3y minus 2. Now I'm going to add 2. So I get x squared plus 2 equals 3y. And then I'm going to divide everything by 3. That's pretty easy as well. Those 3's cancel. And now for my final step is to identify that this is now the inverse function. x squared plus 2 all divided by 3. Now we're not quite done with this problem yet because this original function has a domain restriction and that's going to cause a little bit of a problem for us that we have to just think about here. But it's really, really simple. So first, what is that domain restriction? Well, we know that the inside 3x minus 2, the inside of a square root, must be greater than or equal to 0. So that means that 3x must be greater than or equal to 2 and that means that x must be greater than or equal to 2 thirds. Okay, so the domain of the original function is that x must be greater than or equal to two-thirds. And because that inside is always going to be zero or a positive number, that means the output, the range, is always going to be greater than or equal to zero. The, the, this function will never be below the x-axis because the outputs are always going to be positive. So now when we go to our inverse function where the x's and y's get switched, all we have to do is take that domain restriction. So the domain restriction on our original function is now the range or the output restriction on our new function. So on our new function, the y values must be greater than or equal to two thirds. And again, x was greater than or equal to zero. That was the range restriction on my original function. That's now the domain restriction on my new function. Okay, hopefully that made a lot of sense because remember, all we're doing is switching our x and our y's. So on a function like this where there is a domain and range restriction, all we have to do is switch the x's and y's. So notice that this x became a y, hence y is now greater than or equal to two-thirds. This y became an x, so x now needs to be greater than or equal to zero on my inverse function. So we have to be careful with that. We didn't have to worry about that back in this problem because this was a linear function that has no domain or no range restrictions. It's negative infinity, infinity in all directions. So the inverse is going to have that exact same answer. All right, let's take a look at another problem here. This problem tends to be the most confusing for students. Let's go really, really slowly here. All right, first we're going to follow our rules. First step is change that f of x to a y. A lot of kids want to ignore that first step and then they get lost, so be careful. Then the second step is switching all of my x's and y's so that y becomes an x. The x plus 2 becomes a y plus 2, and the 3x minus 7 becomes a 3y minus 7. Now this step, this is why this problem is actually a little bit difficult, because I have to solve for y, but I have two y's. So how do I solve for y when there's two y's? Well, pay attention because I'm about to show you. The first step is to undo this division by multiplication. So I'm going to take the x, I'm going to multiply it by 3y minus 7. And that's, of course, going to equal y plus 2, because i got to multiply both sides by the 3y minus 7. So on the right side, it'll reduce or cancel away. I'm then going to distribute that x, so I get 3xy minus 7x equals y plus 2. But again, I still have two y's. So how do I solve when there's two y's? Well, again, here's the trick. Hopefully you're paying attention. I'm going to collect any term with a y is going to stay on the left side. Any term without a y is going to go to the right side. So I'm going to move this negative 7x to the right side by adding it. And I'm going to move the y to the left side by subtracting it. So again, I'm going to add 7x to the right side. I'm going to subtract y to the left side. This is going to leave me with 
xy minus y equals 2 plus 7x. Again, all I did was collect any term with a y on the left and any term without a y on the right. Now, how do I take two y's and make them one y? Well, we're going to need the f word. And the f word for a lot of students in math is a bad word, uh, but it's factor. We're going to factor out that y, and that's going to create 3x minus 1 equals the 2 plus 7x. Now remember, when you factor out, you're dividing out. So 3xy divided by y is 3x. y divided by y is a 1. But I'm factoring that y out. Now, all I got to do to solve for y is to divide both sides by 3x minus 1. So I get 2 plus 7x, all divided by 3x minus 1. Really, really, really simple. But don't forget the final step to identify my inverse function, changing that y to an inverse function f raised to negative 1 of x equals 2 plus 7x over 3x minus 1. Not too bad, but I can't tell you how many students really struggle with um, finding the inverse of a rational function. So hopefully that quick explanation there made a lot of sense and you'll be able to nail it. All right, last thing here. Sometimes a function is not invertible, which means we can't find the inverse of it because the inverse function is not a function due to the fact that inputs might have multiple outputs. That makes you not a function. Let me show you an example of what I'm talking about here. So here is a classic quadratic function, x squared, right? Pretty easy. And that's definitely a function. Every input has one output. Now, some outputs get repeated, but that's okay. For example, 2 squared is 4, and negative 2 squared is also 4, but as long as 2 doesn't go anywhere else, and negative 2 doesn't go anywhere else, we are a function. Now, if I switch all of my x's and y's from this graph, making the inverse graph, or reflecting it across the line y equals x, I get this. This is the inverse function. But this is, well, not a function because, for example, 2 has multiple outputs. It's got an output right here and an output down here, and that's not a function. We cannot have an input of 2 have multiple outputs. So there's a problem, like, like, yes, the function on the left is a function, but its inverse is, well, not a function. So how do we fix this? Well, we can fix this by restricting the domain of the original function so that the inverse is, in fact, a function. Let me explain again. So let's go back to x squared. Now, if I say, all right, that original function x squared, let's restrict its domain to only x greater than or equal to zero which means we're, we're getting rid of the left side, that left side that was over here, we're getting rid of it, it's gone, and we're only going to allow this function to be defined when x is greater than or equal to zero. Now, when I go ahead and find the inverse by switching my x's and y's or reflecting across the line y equals x, then I get this function right here, which is an actual function. So this right here is the inverse function, and it, it again, it is a real function, but again, I took my inputs, remember my over here, I restricted my domain to x greater than or equal to zero. So now over here, my range is restricted to greater than or equal to zero because if you switch your x's and y's, well then this x right here has to switch to a y. And of course we see that in the graph, the outputs y are greater than or equal to zero. So we can find the inverse of some of these functions that technically don't have inverses if we first restrict the domain of the original function so that when we find the inverse, we can do it. Let's do an analytical example of this. So here we have the quadratic function 2x squared plus 3, but we have to restrict this domain to being x greater than or equal to 0. That way we can find the domain. So if we think about a graph of this real quick, it's going to be something roughly like that. But again, if we reflect that across the y equals x line, we're not going to get a function. So we're going to restrict it. So we're going to ignore the part over here, and we're going to only say this function is defined when x is greater than or equal to zero. Now I can go ahead and follow my steps. So switch the f of x to a y. Switch my x's and y's around. And then solve for y. I'm going to subtract 3. Divide everything by 2. That'll cancel out the 2 in front of the y squared. And then I'm going to take my square root of both sides. And now the square and the square root will cancel, and I can officially define my function as, or my inverse function, excuse me, as the square root of x minus 3 divided by 2. Now, again, remember, I'm only looking at the positive side. That means that in my inverse function, y, my outputs will be greater than or equal to 0 only. And again, that allows me to do it, because otherwise, I, I can't do it. So hopefully that makes sense. And again, I want you to notice, first and foremost, I'm following the four steps.
I cannot change those four steps to finding an inverse. Some functions, though, have to have their domain restricted. That way, when we go and find the inverse, it, well, is a function. So hopefully that was a quick review of our inverse functions, and you'll be able to do it with a table, graph, or an analytical, analytical representation, and you'll be good to go.